Welcome to the CEN Show, the voice of the world community. <clears throat> the Community Education Network is an organization that recognizes that global issues and issues here in the United States are in need of positive change. And we are a part of the change agent. I could say that. I'm your host, Rosky Mascani. Tonight's guest is educator Ronnie Roberts. He's a close companion of mine and he shares meaningful information with me on a consistent basis. A few weeks ago, he texted me with an excerpt from James Baldwin's Blues for Mr. Charlie. And it prompted this show this evening. Good evening, Brother Robert, Ronnie. How are you? Tell us something about yourself and let's start this presentation. I'm great, Rigo. Um... Uh, as you said, we we're longtime friends. We talked together and worked together and, and bonded in 2001. So 21-year relationship that has been nothing but positive. Um, we both math teachers by background. Uh, I guess this is my third or fourth appearance on the um, Conscious Corner show. Um, I don't know. It's one of the... Uh, one, James Baldwin has always been someone that just intrigued me with his with his in your face commentary and his way to um, illuminate the, uh, the the black white issue that's going on in this country that so defines us as a nation. Um, you know, and he, three of his three or four of his key points pretty much sum up my political and and historical perspectives. Uh, the number one being neither love nor terror makes one blind, indifference makes one blind. Talking about indifference, um, it's, it's so, the masses of the population, black, white, Hispanic, whatever color, just Americans, um, our indifference to tragedy is appalling to me. I mean, we should be up in arms as a country and as a nation and as a people who supposedly follow Christian principles. Um, we should just be up in arms about little kids getting shot under any circumstance. We should be up in arms about grown folks getting shot. We should be up in arms about anybody getting shot. I, I realize we are a cowboy country founded on a cowboy culture uh, the American Revolution was supposedly um, about freeing us from the uh, confines of India and from Great Britain and their rule and the king. We escaped the America, we, you know, the, the, the European Americans that are here at least were escaping oppressive rule and the king of England and, and that rule so they could not have a king and have their own free government. And then they established pretty much a tyranny. Uh, all of the writers of the Constitution, as we know, uh, many of them, uh, many of our founding fathers were slave owners, and uh, most of them weren't really Christians per se, they were deists and theists. Uh, they believed in a higher power, but they was pretty adam pretty adam adam about separating church and the state. They knew that the two didn't mix. You don't want to mix religion with politics, which is uh, pretty much a reflection of where we are today with the minority party being the Republican Party being in control for so many of the last few years because of two flawed institutions that the Constitution set up. Number one, the United States Senate, which gives two senators for every state, no matter the size of the state, and the Electoral College, which is uh, has decided three of the last two of the last five uh, presidential elections. And through the last five presidential elections, the person with the minority vote won. Uh, one man, one vote, that just kills it all right there. But again, going back to how this system was, was, was formed, um, you know, it's just, it's amazing. You know, for guys like Ra, you, Muscani, and myself, um, we pretty much go by the, uh, the uh, mantra that if I love you, I have to make conscious, I have to make you conscious of the things you don't see. Another one of James Baldwin's statements. Let me, let me repeat that. If I love you, 
I have to make you conscious of the things you don't see. That statement just tells me, that statement leads me right back to you and Ra again. Um, James Baldwin again on that statement. So let me get right into reading the statement that I sent to you um, uh, right after the shooting in Buffalo, which was just absolutely appalling to me as well as the world. And um, it first it listed the 10 names, three of the 10 names. He hadn't even gotten through all of the names yet. The names are still being revealed. I keep hearing the same questions, whether they were murdered in cold blood by the state or citizens acting on behalf of the state's telepathic commands. Now, this is written by James Baldwin in 1964, which is the year I turned 18 and graduated from high school, which is also the same year that three of the last five presidents graduated from high school, May and June of 64, uh, George Bush, Bill Clinton, and Donald Trump all graduated from high school in 1964. So some of the geopolitical things and some of their reflections were basically geared by the times we were, we were brought up in and were living. But go on with the statement, 1964. I keep hearing the same questions whenever we are murdered in cold blood by the state or citizens acting on behalf of the state's telepathic commands, which he's referring to the police. Why, what is the government going to do to stop this? Face the answer. Nothing. What is the nation going to do about gun violence? Um, nothing. Why were the cops so gentle with the mass murderer? We're talking primarily about the Buffalo shooting when this came out. Um, face the answer. Because it's one of them. How many more black lives have to be sacrificed before something is done? Face the answer. All of them. Why doesn't God intervene? Judeo Christian state, right? Face the answer because he's their God, not ours. Who is going to save us? Face the answer nobody. And I'm thinking to the alleged G's, you have so much smoke for the hood. Your masses trained you so well that your weapons forever point inward, inward, but never outward. Is the G for gangster or gutless? This is 1964 now, before gangs became prominent like they are now. How many more black people have to be genocided before we make the difficult decision to be Sparta to their Athens, which is relating to the 300, that, that, that story. Richard, you're still determined to break your neck. One either, well, it's a neck breaking time. I wouldn't like to appear to be above the battle. Written by James Baldwin in his um, book or series of essays and poems called Blues for Mr. Charlie. It says at the end, I'm tired of praying and I'm tired of calling on the ancestors to do our work for us. This is so profound that that was written in 1964. Just, just incredible that the wisdom of this man written 58 years ago so succinctly applies to what's going on in the world right today. Less than a week after the Buffalo shooting, a couple of days after the Buffalo shooting, in fact, an Asian man broke into a church or a synagogue in California and killed some parishioners or members of the church. Um, then now we have what's going on in Uvalde, Texas, uh, where 19 innocent little babies from fourth through, from second through fourth grade were just slaughtered along with two educators and the um, government himself. Um, what do you say to that uh, as, a, as a society? How did that happen? Uh, what was the, um, the key factor that made that happen? Well, the, those on the right and those who consistently vote against gun laws and gun regulation, who are backed by the NRA or the National Rifle Association say mental health and then do nothing about mental health. Is he crazy? Or somebody goes and shoots little kids, there's obviously mental issues there, but I mean, that kind of stuff can slip through the cracks so easily in a nation of 330 million people. How do you, you know, assess everybody's mental aspect? It's, it's difficult to do that. It's impossible to do that from a mental standpoint. But what you can control is the hardware or the vehicle 
that made that massacre possible, which is an AR-15 or an automatic rifle that, that went from M16s, which was a, a military a weapon that was used extensively by our troops. And then Colt, the manufacturer of this uh, uh, gun, wanted to sell it to Americans, to the public. After, <clears throat> and the public initially resisted because the NRA was initially composed of mostly hunters and just really a lot of ragweed types, but a lot of Democrats, including myself, own guns. I have handguns. I've kept a handgun by my bed since I was an adult. But it's never left my house other than to go to the shooting range once a year to uh, polish up on my skills. And the, and the reason for that gun is just purely self defense, which is more of what the Constitution was about when they were talking about the Second Amendment. And, you know, we didn't have a standing army per se when the Second Amendment was done. Uh, you know, these, our constant, the writers of our Constitution, our founding fathers were slave owners and, and, and men who were just really wise beyond their years because many facets of the Constitution have held up throughout the years, but there have been many other facets that haven't held up, which is the reason for all the numerous amendments. And there need to be more. There needs to be a looking at, uh, a look at that to really rewrite it to a degree, but that's never gonna happen because it was written to protect the majority population. You gotta remember when the constitution was written, we weren't what, considered four fifths of a human, some, some madness like that. And, and the very writers themselves owned some of us. I mean, how does that stand the test of time? The fact that it has stood for over 200 years with just a few amendments is eye opening from the standpoint. It tells me that the guys who put it together, the, the founders were really some wise men, very wise men, and, and made a lasting document that's gonna live on forever. But you know, just as any other thing, times are changing. You need to make changes to things that we think are embedded in our society. Some, some of these things are being fixed. Is it gonna get fixed? Not in our lifetimes. Possibly so in our kids' lifetime, by our grandchildren, simply because the demographics are going to change the political scene. The, the one key thing that Donald Trump said that I that I that I that really opened my eyes and made me think he's not as, as insane as he makes out to be, is that if I don't win this presidency, it'll never be another Republican president. And it's just because of the numbers themselves. The Republican Party is already a minority party, numbers-wise. They stay in power by a, a political trick called gerrymandering, which is the Democrats have done themselves too as long as they were in power. The Republicans and the Democrats have so much in common um, that it's not even funny. They're all funded by all, all, big oil. That's why, you know, the oil companies right now have record-setting profits because of the high prices of gasoline. And uh, it's supported by the Democrats and Republicans because they're paying on both. Why don't we have rational gun control legislation, which most Republicans in this country really want? They don't want to see their kids slaughtered, the little kids slaughtered, because the congressmen and senators are beholden to the National Rifle Association. Um, as I said earlier, uh, what am I? What am I? Basis. Well, what do I think needs to be done? I mean, to, to, to stop this. Um, a couple of obvious things. Number one, raising the age of before you can purchase uh, a rifle to or any type of weapon to 21. Uh, absolutely, we had a 10 year ban on assault rifles. That was the Joe Biden was the leading senator, but it was under Bill Clinton in 1994 that we got guns assault rifles just banned. And for 10 years, we, we had it banned. And then Republicans got in office, boom, NRA. As a result of the ban, NRA spent more money than they've ever spent, knocked out the Speaker of the House, which is Tom Rowley, a Democrat, and flipped the House from Democrat to Republican, which was really the start of all of the separation and the deep chasm that has come between the Republican and Democratic parties now. It really started in 1994 
behind the gun control legislation that was passed by the Democrats and subsequently allowed to lapse under Republican administrations. Again, what rules America? Not black, not white, not brown, not yellow, but green money. Well, very interesting, very interesting. I wanted to get other people's take on, on what you presented, Brother Ronnie. So I, I see somebody that's new here. Jacqueline House, are you, are you there? You able to speak? Maybe just listening. Okay, yeah, Brother. Jacqueline House, is, Jacqueline House is, uh, man, for coming in, Jack, I'm sorry, Ms. Cinder, I will let you go. Jacqueline House is a personal friend of mine. Uh, she called me this evening while I was napping to let me know that there had been an attack in Tulsa. A gunman has killed four people, three people at St. Anthony Hospital where she goes to the hospital. I recently told you about my friend who had had back surgery and her doctor's in that same building. And a gunman goes into Tulsa, St. Francis Hospital, the biggest hospital in the city of Tulsa. And so supposedly looking for a doctor and kill three people. We don't know who the people are. All we don't know who he is. He hasn't been identified other than to say he's a 35 year old man, but he was killed in an encounter. And just another example of gun violence. We've had since the Buffalo incident, 11 different shootings. So Ms. House is, is, is here as a guest of mine. I, I don't know if she wants to speak one way or another. She has some ideas, though, I'm sure. Okay, well, I don't know. I don't know if her uh, mic is, is on, but she could, if she'd like to, she could chime in. I'm gonna go ahead and go to Brother Machinda. Brother Machinda. Hey, all right. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was gonna mention that as well. We just covered it, the Tulsa, Oklahoma incident, you know, that hospital. I had heard about that earlier myself. I said, well, there, there it goes again. But I think, you know, covering a lot of um, points that make a lot of sense, you know, I'm in agreement with. Um, you know, I don't think, you know, I'm down here in the South, and um, you're not taking guns from the folks down here. You know, that's, you know, it's, it, they going to die before you take their gun. You know, that's just the way it is. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a mindset. You know, I was interacting with a Caucasian today, security officer sitting at his desk. We talked from time to time. I run into him, you know, on the job, you know, and he was talking about, uh, hey, look at this. He was showing me articles of, uh, the lady in the Congress, AOC, Ocasio, you know, talking about the squad. And I said, so, you know, I, I talked to him like, you know, I said, so what's wrong with these folks? You know, and I asked him and he said, well, he used to be a police. And, but he and I, we got to, we, we, we communicate, you know, which is good, you know, because, you know, but I know when to hold and when to fold with him. But anyway, basically having that conversation that, you know, it's entrenched in their mindset and they're not relinquishing it. It's gonna, it's gonna be through attrition. It's gonna do, do natural, uh, a natural transfer, you know, birth rate versus death rate, mortality rate. Um, you know, the mortality rate is eating them up. They've been aware of it for a long time. So they're hanging on for dear life in terms of their, the way they see life. You know, we're dealing with cowboys, you know, that, you know, kind of manifested into a modern technological cowboy, some of them, and they're not trying to uh, unleash their, their stronghold on their, their way of life, their dominance, you know, who they are, what they do, their piracy, you know, I can name a lot of other terms. And so with that, yeah, they're not giving the, so it would be like, say your great grandkids, you know, or whoever, you know, when that time comes, I think they said like 2050 or something, it's going to be at a certain percent birth rate. And as time goes on, like you say, things will evolve. You know, things are going to fix itself naturally anyway. But unfortunately, yeah, there's not, we're not going to get any relief as far as, you know, relying on them to make a change. You know, like I said, we got to survive this life ourselves. And uh, we on this show, uh, it's been discussed, you know, 
about how we should work together, come together, be together, a continuous fight. You know, like Dr. You know, Professor Rao always said, you know, this this didn't, this wasn't invented, you know, today or a few days ago. People have been struggling for a long time. People have been fighting. There are a lot of great people out there trying to keep it, you know, keep the struggle alive. You know, the awareness, uh, like you made a quote from uh, James Baldwin, was I thought was very excellent as far as, you know, uh, you know, enlightening other people in it, uh, not, you know, the paraphrase is to, uh, you know, to, you know, something that you don't know, you know, I, you know, I'll let you know, you know, don't hoard information, you know, spread information that's, that's valuable, that's, that's, that's beneficial to people. You know, we live in a society where they sell information, uh, you know, they, they create these educational systems that are, you know, it, it's, and we all work in them and I've worked in them and I'm working in them now and, and we do the best we can, but, you know, as far as, you know, certain things that maybe should be taught or shouldn't be taught and all those kind of things, you know, again, they control the narrative to a certain degree, but that's what, like I said, we've developed, you know, continue to develop our own and make our own ways and, and, and write, you know, rewrite or, can, you know, what needs to be written versus, you know, the untruths and the, you know, the things that's been carried out. But anyway, I don't want to go on and on. Thank you for presenting tonight. And I enjoy, uh, uh, I look forward to continue to listen to more. Yeah, we got more, I tell you. We got some more. Okay, Professor Rock. Everybody, I appreciate what's been said. If I understand correctly, I want to say uh, uh, I agree with what's been said by Brother Machinda and, and Brother Robert. But, you know, the issue of gun in America, well, first of all, James Baldwin is a historical personality uh, that has contributed so much to the fourth floor of our conscious liberation. There's always a thing that said the pen, meaning the pencil or the writing instrument is more powerful than the sword. And, um, uh, you know, because of it, it makes people think and it changes people uh, in many ways. And so um, we appreciate James Baldwin's writings, you know, Fire Next Time, Native Son, uh, Giovante, all the things that he's done and putting his blackness before his gayness. And uh, even though he had to go to Europe to get away from the ostracizing of, of of his sexuality, but he still came back and participated in the civil rights movement, marched with people, and wrote about uh, the, the, the realities of, uh, of America, how he saw it. And we deeply appreciate James Baldwin uh, uh, becoming a, um, a, 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 a weapon of mass consciousness through his writing. And we did deeply appreciate him. He's, his books are often used in Black Studies literature classes. And he's one of our classic uh, writers and activists. And so we must put that. But the, the thing that I really enjoy about him, he put his Blackness is identified with his, with his people before he put uh, his sexuality in front. And when it comes to guns in America, Dr. Francis Cress Wilson said something that's a very profound one. She said, uh, she said two things. One, that the gun is considered to be the great equalizer. Because white folks are the minority on the planet. In order to control and rule the planet, they needed weapons that would offset the majority of the people. Uh, and so that's why one reason that they created it. Uh, for uh, as a weapon of war. There's a lot of people that have blow gun and, uh, you know, that was used for hunting for the most part by Africans, but the European took that and made it into um, a weapon for him, for him to oppress and intimidate and uh, 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 create deprivation on people along with, uh, you know, his, 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 the black powder or the gunpowder and, 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 and all those are chemical weapons. A, a gun is a, a, a chemical tool, a tool to a, a use a, a chemical 
process called a bullet. So you have to understand that, that this is something that went from hunting to uh, you know, uh, exploitation and domination. When they first came over here, they just had uh, steel knives. And uh, that's what the Native American called them, iron knives. Then they matriculated into Winchesters and all the other guns, muskets, and things of that nature that they brought over here to dominate those that were unarmed. Native Americans did not have guns. Africans did not have guns. And they invited these people in as guests and they used their weapons to take their land and take their lives, take their culture and enslave many of them. But anyway, as the brother Ronnie was saying, there should be some rationale. No, rationale is not going to uh, get as much into was saying these Europeans to give up their guns. And um, just like there's a law against having drugs, even if you had a law against guns, uh, it, would, it, it would be a good thing. But at the same time, they just have, uh, uh, you know, hidden guns. That's why one reason they couldn't pass a law against liquor, because they couldn't control the people. And, and it created riots and created all kind of havoc in the society. So they decided to this just tax it. And so when we get ready to deal with uh, uh, gun control, uh, well, you know, the reason they don't want other people to have it. Now, let me give you an example. As Ronnie was saying about the, the mass shootings and in uh, this country saying that these, 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 some of these uh, guns are mass, mass weapons uh, used to kill a lot of people at one time and they're weapons of mass destruction. It's hard for a country to tell people to give up their guns. And they got bombs that kill people, kids and everybody. They talking about the shootings in Buffalo, the shootings in um, uh, New York, the shootings in Tulsa, the shootings here in, uh, in the various schools and churches and, you know, but these are the same people bombing other people of color or letting people die by preventing others to, uh, to help them for starvation. And, and, and these are kids dying too. You know, they won't even criticize Israelis. They, they arm the Israelis and they're just bombing Palestinian kids. See, the contradictions, you have to see through it. Now, yeah, if they are serious, they will pass a law about the age to buy a gun, just like they have laws about age, ages to, um, to drive and to buy cigarettes and liquor. Now, could there be exceptions? Yeah, with special permission and special, if they meet certain guidelines, maybe a 17, 18 year old can have a gun, you know, a certain type of gun. You understand? If, 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 you, if you're serious. Then second, it must be required training, at least once a year. Everybody have a gun, have to go through some form of training, certification, and pay for it. They pay for it. Just like we have to pay to register our cars all the time in California. You know, I mean, hey, okay, you want to have a gun? I'm going to make it hard for you to have a gun. But you had the right to have one. But I'm going to put these regulations in. And then the same thing, every gun owner should have, a, have to require to meet certain uh, standards to get a license to own a gun. You know, you have to have a license to drive a car. A car, a car is just as dangerous as a gun in many ways when you're drunk and you're driving 100 miles an hour and running into a crowd of people. You know, so that's why they have these laws against that. Second, they do already have laws against people having guns. Felons can't have guns. So don't tell me everybody had a right to have a gun. Well, why can't felons have one? Who passed that law? You know, so if you can stop felons from having guns, you can stop teenagers from having guns. You see what I'm saying? Now, a felon can never have one. You understand? But the point is, is that the, they, they lying to the people. They lying to the people. Just like they... they Lying is just as easy as breathing to them. You know, the illusion of that they are concerned about gun violence, that's a, that, that is the most ridiculous statement out. Then, then second, they can have a gun, 
a knife for the gun and ammunition. This man who uh, was born into a uh, he bought 2,000 rounds of ammunition the same day he bought his gun. You know, that should be a license and, uh, uh, you know, um, you know, some form of checking. Like if you go to buy a gun in California, they have some of the toughest laws. You know, it takes two weeks before you get the gun. You know, if you buy it from a gun shop. You know, uh, you have to stop all gun shows. You know what, what? What the? What's the point in having a gun show? It's to sell guns immediately. You know, and get around background checks. Third, that uh, another thing that they should uh, uh, stop all illegal sales of guns. That you have to have a special license, and that license should be. Uh, required of the person, then they have to meet certain standards in order to sell the gun. Can't just be a mom and pop store just opening and selling guns, selling guns out their garage, selling guns at gun shows, selling guns on the corner, selling guns out the trunk of your car. Then it should always cost uh, uh, to have uh, to and, and 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 you know you can't make regulations against making guns. You know, uh, uh, manufacturing. You know, you have to have a license to make or to uh, 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 de develop these type of weapons and, and, and things of this nature. And I, you know, and then at the same time, uh, 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 you know, if you're going to buy a high powered rifle, then there should be some regulations that go with it. Some type of psychiatric uh, analysis and some type of written rationale for why you want a gun. Now you say, okay, uh, uh, you know, what do you, what do you want a gun for in an urban area? Ain't no, ain't no rabbits running around. Ain't no, you know, I mean, you know, ain't no, uh, a possum, no, you, you know, it's against the law to shoot them. So what do you, what do you, what do you, what do you need a gun for? They said to protect themselves. What? Well, yeah, back back in the rural areas when it's the agricultural society and they take the police and the sheriffs was on horses. It take two days to get to your house or get to your area to help find thieves or something. So you administer justice on the spot. <clears throat> rather than, you know, uh, uh, but, you know, it, it's just, you have to say, to me, if they're serious, they would make some serious rules and regulations. Uh, but at the same time, because of their fear of people, uh, ethnic minorities in this country, uh, and so they develop rate ways to suppress. First of all, they make guns so high. You know, when you get ready to buy an AR-15, you're talking almost about $1,000. Bullets are high. The most black people can't afford it. Second, they won't even let certain countries. They went over to Iraq because they said he was developing weapons of mass destruction. Well, you went over there and used weapons of mass destruction to cop, cop, keep him from making them or having them. It don't make sense. This is a this is a psychotic people we're dealing with. And as CV uh, uh, said, uh, I forget his name, said, what kind of people are these that hate people that ain't done nothing to them? Oppress, demonize, deprive, and devastate people that have not done nothing to them. And then they keep calling them blacks and browns and things. Why not this American, uh, even though there's a question about that, uh, you know, uh, just a United States citizen. You understand? I mean, that, that, that's, that's very critical. If, if you're all United States citizens, then there shouldn't be no division with regards to your identity. But they make the distinction. 
They have race talk and race practice. But what Brother Roberts is raising uh, is, is very important and a very serious discussion. Because like he said, I, he has guns. And you know, uh, and other, other people have guns and they don't want to give them up, even though he admit, hey, I don't even take mine out unless I get to go to the rain. But there are people that, you know, the gun give them an advantage, especially on people that don't have one. And second, you can't arm everybody because people just take your gun from you, you know, off your dead body. You know, I mean, people shoot people in the back. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a different game out there. America, a part of its cultural apparatus is oppression of people on the planet so that they can have power to determine what laws um, should be used. And the law that allows them to have guns is not just uh, a law of, of practicing a constitutional right. It's a practice to oppress the rest of the world. Sante Sano. All right, uh, Brother Machinda had something to interject, he said. Go ahead, Brother Machinda. No, I'm just listening, man. I just wanted to say, like, you know, down here in the south of Louisiana, you know, they, they're pushing the, you know, uh, a no permit law, you know. Right now, I can carry a gun with no problem. I can walk in the store with a gun on my, or like, on my hip. You know, no big deal. Ain't nobody going to say nothing. If I get stopped by the police and I got a gun in the car, I tell you, man, I got a gun in the glove compartment. You, we, we all know how that may play out. So I'm, I'm just being hypothetical where, you know, they, they look at it and uh, they'll run a make on the gun, whatever. If it's not stolen or if it's not, you know, you know, the serial number is not obliterated, they give it back to you and have a nice day. Now, will it play out for us like that all the time? Maybe not. They'll probably harass us a little more. And I'm sure there's situations like that. But, in, but generally speaking, with the way the law is carried out here, you know, the way it's written is like, you know, there's no, no checks and balances. There's, I mean, the police will check it out and say, okay, here's your gun back, whatever. And, and, uh, they, but they're trying to go, uh, for this, uh, no, you, you, you know, the concealed weapons license permit, you know, to have that, to conceal it, they, they get ready to get rid of that to where you don't even need a permit to conceal it, you know, and it's, it's, it's being heavily looked at, and a tech, I think Texas already passed it, if I'm not mistaken. I know Texas is doing a lot over there. They're doing the most in Texas, and Louisiana is right next door. And uh, so I'm just saying, so you have these beliefs, you know, this, these mindsets that, you know, you know, again, protecting yourself is one thing, you know, but being an extremist is a whole other thing, you know. I was talking about the Caucasians, you know. Uh, a lot of Caucasians around, you know, working education and stuff like that, you know, down here. And uh, one of them pretty cool. And a uh, matter of fact, he kind of turned me on to the gig that I've been having for the last 19 years. So not a bad dude in, in certain regards. He admitted that he was a, he had a problem back in the day in terms of, uh, you know, driving a diesel truck across country, delivering whatever, and with a Confederate flag on his truck. And so that's what, you know, that's what the problem was, you know. But, you know, he kind of, you know, he said he uh, joined the church and changed his life. And, I, and the dude was always been respectful to me. But that, that I'm not trying to make a, the point I'm making with him, though. He and I would go to lunch, you know, like every now and then, you know, I was he worked in IT, you know, if, you know, he was the IT guy, the director. And I worked in IT as well as teaching and what have you. And uh, but I would do a lot of IT work on campus with him and things like that. And uh, so we go to Subway, get a sandwich or something. And then right after in Walmart, and then he said, hey, let's go over to the section. He go over to the gun section in Walmart and looking for bullets. All the bullets be gone. Bullets are gone. And uh, I'm like, man, why are you guys so crazy about it? This is a year, this is uh, several years ago because he's been retired, I guess, five, six years. But he said, uh, you know, we prepare it. That's what he said. It's a lot going on, you know. And they're uh, subscribers to the Fox News Network. You know, that's their that's their God almost, you know, they, you know, I don't subscribe to none of them. I don't subscribe. I listen to all of them. And, I, I, you know, I see where the enemy at is on, on all fronts as much as possible. You have to triangulate. You have to see what's going on on all angles and, and use your energy to discern 
they read between the lines at the same. So anyway, they, they, there's a belief. And so the governor here in this ta- in this state, he's a Democrat, but he's pressured. You know, he's a hunter and a, a sportsman. But he said, you know, the, the AK-47s and all that kind of stuff, he's, you know, he's not really for that. But uh, these these the other folks have vetoed him because they have enough power. They already overrode one of his vetoes for something else. And so he's pressured into giving in to a certain degree and whatever. But he's not running again, but still, you know, politically trying to save face or do whatever. You know, but a lot of these old white boys out here, man, they, they used to have guns in high school, you know, in their Jeeps and cars and they don't even like their vehicles. How do I know? Because, you know, I, I, you know, like I say, trying to be uh, my own little social scientist and doing my own research. And you talk to folks and they tell you everything. And I, I've talked to several different people over a period of time. And then that was pretty common back in the uh, 80s, you know, 70s, 80s, whatever, even probably before that, you know where they would drive to their their high school and, and park their car in the Jeep because and, and, they're going hunting when they get out of school. Nobody messes with the guns. They're just gun enthusiasts. They love guns. They hunt. They do this and do that. But the way the world is, and they feel like they're losing their freedoms, and uh, the, the, the world, the way they know it is changing. You know, Tom Mesker of the Ku Klux Klan in San Diego spoke on it. When I was down there, you know, he, he he spoke on it well. He understands the 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 birth rate and understands the future. And they don't want to change. They don't want to change, you know. So anyway, obsession with these guns and bullets and and, and things like that, you know. And uh, it's it's just uh, it's 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 well, it, it ends up being terrible because the a lot of the youngsters that that follow under them that that don't even understand. I mean, I wouldn't anticipate my boy, the white dude, going around shooting up people, but you never know. I mean, but I mean, again, I would, but it's, it's it's the message that they're sending to the youngsters that's growing up in this peer group, uh, this social media age. That uh, uh, I think there's a uh, what is it? Tupac has a a um, uh, 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 rap. You know, it's 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 it, it's it's pretty deep. One of my favorite ones called "Dumping," and it talks about a uh, you know, uh, it's it like you know, a, you know, rebels without a cause. Like that's the ba- bottom line. No, no, no. It says no, uh, no. They have no, uh, no cause. You know, basically they're they're fighting no cause. They they're just just wild and you know, it, it, reckless and abandoned. They're in their thinking. You know. So, which is very dangerous in the society, you know. But, uh, but it's it's in there with those lyrics. I can't, I couldn't think, I can't think of them right now. And I've heard the song a bunch of times. I'm not trying to be a rapper, but you know, it's consciousness. You know, I mean, there's other things I might not agree with in rap or whatever. But no, that's my era. I grew up, you know. I I submit to that in a very very creative uh, song, and uh, in that song called "Dumping," you know, just if you should listen to it, you know these youngsters is, is, is out of control, you know, in a lot of ways. So anyway, I just want, I'm just listening and I just wanted to throw that in here. You know, what's happening down here in the South. Uh, take it easy. I'm good. Roger. Right. Yeah. Roger. Yeah. One second. One second, Rod. Now, uh, brother Ronnie, how much time do you have? Do you have I got plenty. Uh, Okay. I, got a thing. I just got an update on the Tulsa shooting. Uh, my friend Jacqueline House that was on here earlier, she just found out that it was her doctor. She was just in his office a few days ago, Dr. Phillips, an orthopedic surgeon who did her back surgery. She could have been there at that time. I mean, you're talking about Machinda, you're in Louisiana, I'm in Oklahoma. Uh, they're still riding around with rifles in their trucks. Uh, Oklahoma has open carry. You know, uh, you can get a, you had to get a license a few years ago, but now you don't even need that. So, you know, it, it's in our culture, which is a sick culture, but you know, you, you stop and ask yourself, for the people who don't know, what is an AR-15? It's a semi-automatic rifle, meaning the gun basically reloads itself. Every time you pull the trigger it fires, it will fire up to a hundred rounds a minute. How are you going to hunt something with that? It, first of all, it's not very accurate. It's a short-term gun as far as the shooting. You know, when you're hunting targets, you know, when they first introduced it, 
to the to the and the NRA didn't even like the gun when it was first introduced. Because they said, hey, they they pride themselves on accuracy. What do you need that for? But the militia groups immediately pounced on that. The gangsters, black, white, Italian, immediately pounced on these weapons. And the reason that Bill Clinton was able to push this through with the help of Joe Biden and have a 10 year ban on assault rifles is the very heart of the Uvalde shooting. What I'm saying by that is that the officers were there for uh, almost a whole hour while this man was inside the school. And they declared it as a hostage type situation so they didn't have to rush in there rather than just a murder, which is, was just murder one. He was just executing people. But here's my thing. The reason that the officers declared that was pretty obvious. For one, they were just aware of the Buffalo shooting where the, where the guard that was the former policeman was shot in the head. No body armor covers your head, number one. Number two, they were where he had an AR-15 from the, the sounds of the rifle going off. If they run in there, some of them die. I wouldn't run in there, but I wouldn't be a policeman either. But if you're charged with their responsibility, you know, they're trying to make it the policeman's fault that this happened. Well, who's going to run into live bullets? Finally, the Texas Department of the, the Border Patrol people were the ones who really actually killed him, not the Uvalde police, not the Uvalde school system police, who's an ex-policeman and who's just not, just elected to the city council. And he don't want to talk about it. I'm not really blaming him. The reason that this passed when Clinton and Biden got it through for 10 years and had the assault ban was that police officers said, we don't want to battle against folks equipped with these. So it passed. So now the policemen have changed their minds. Again, NRA influence, again, money influence, again, just other sure madness. And as, and as Ryan Machina says, we're never going to take the guns out of America. We just want to take the guns out of certain people's hands. We want to make it difficult to, to, to get a gun. We want to make it difficult to keep a gun. And we want to make certain that kids and 18 year olds are kids. We have children, we've had 18 year olds. They're still kids. We want to make certain that at least you are at 21 years old before you do that. And it's kind of exacerbated by the fact that the last two shootings were done by 18 year olds who legally purchased these guns, by the way. It's hard to get a gun in New York. The Buffalo shooting, it's hard to get a gun in New York. New York has some of the most restrictive gun laws in the nation behind California, that they still got them. But 18 year olds shouldn't be getting them. All right, Rob. See, even if they pass laws about don't have guns, people still have them. There's a law against murder, people still kill. There's a law against stealing, people still steal. There's, you can have all the laws you want, but it would help with regards to minimizing uh, the, the, the people uh, just having guns and not knowing what they're doing with them or with the mentally ill. Now, the guy in uh, Texas, the governor said, they got a mental, Ill prom mental illness problem in all of Texas. They cut the budget for mental illness services. But then he said, well, you know, it's not the gun, it's the people that do the killing. Well, if you got admitted that you have mental illnesses that's out of control in your state, that's more of a reason to pass more gun regulations <clears throat> and, and things. You know, now nah, listen, people, you know, a lot of people, <laughs> I hear brothers and sisters say, you know, hey, look, you know, if, if you take the, uh, 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 the gun from the people, only the criminals will have the gun. This is not about guns. This is about war. Arming and allowing white people, for the most part, you know, some minorities, you know, they get guns, but white folks, they, you know, like, 
they be having, they, they make them in their garage. There are more guns out. They, they cannot have gun control. You can have gun regulation. But you ain't going to stop people from having guns. You can just make it harder for them to get them. Make them go through changes in standards. Tax them. Make it, make it, make the tax that you put on them pay for the injuries of people. Just like they make, put taxes on cigarettes to pay for people get cancer. Those are the type of things that they need to start thinking about to regulate gun uses and sales and manufacturing in the society. With regulation, with heavy fines, and uh, you know, felonies, if you violate, to save people's lives. But more people die every day from guns to a child by individuals killing one person or two people versus people going in there and shooting 10 people at one time. I mean, that catches up. Absolutely. Absolutely. In, in New York and in Chicago, they said, well, 30 people got shot last night. You know, and they ain't no, well, they don't look at that as mass killing because, you know, there were individuals that got in a fight, a dice fight, a gang fight. <clears throat> My point is, when we was coming up, fighting was about fist fighting. Every now and then a bumper jack, zip gun. And I'm gonna tell you something else. When we was coming up, they had a law saying that you could not have a sawed off shotgun. See? And then they had a law about how many shots you can put in a shotgun, even when you hunt. That's why you Jillian could put three shotgun, buckshot, in a, in a shotgun. Because it's too much advantage on the animal. And it's too much advantage on people. When you saw off that saw off shotgun, it sprays when it comes out. So you hit a lot of innocent people, or you ain't gonna miss your target. They're going to get some buckshot. You know, I mean, they got over and under. They got so many different. They got, just like they got different model cars, they got different model guns. 3D guns. Ghost guns. I mean, because it neutralizes and gives them the advantage of people of color. Because they know most people of color, if they get caught with a gun, it's severe punishment. No, I'm jail. When white folks get caught with a gun, it's like what Machinda said, I'll keep on going. You see what I'm saying? Now, one of the biggest weapons are pipe bombs. They're all over the place. They're not even talking about them yet. But they will be. Sante Sante. All right, uh, Brother Ronnie, did you want to go with that video or you want to, what you want to do? Uh, yeah, I want to do the video, but first of all, this is um, June the 1st and May the 31st, and June the 1st were 1921, were the days of the uh, Tulsa Race Massacre, uh, Black Wall Street, as my shirt says. Remember Black Wall Street and just want you to, um, take a shout out for those people who were slaughtered in Tulsa. Uh, had no guns, the whites just came down and killed them and burned down all of their property because of an alleged man, black man touching a woman on the elevator. It's, again, this is just a precursor or a result. This is just, that incident is just now, 101 years later, this madness is still going on about just what Raw was saying about guns having the power of being used against people of color. First American Indian, the red man. Then, you know, they brought us over here, then the black man, and then they brought the Chinese here to build the Intercontinental Railroad. We don't have Chinese contributed a heck of a lot to our system, paid them literally nothing. 
uh, for the slum housing that they were living in, the nasty food that they were eating. But the Chinese came here, you know, seeking the same things that the Europeans did. Uh, freedom from religious oppression, the ability to assimilate, the ability to stay in their own communities and to have a way of life without political repression. Now, with this current Republican Party and the state of it, that is exactly what political oppression means. And it's all, you know, you, you stop and think of um, how they got in charge and, and they're all hiding behind the Bible. That's what's so killing that and, and religion. You know, the majority of the Republican Party claims themselves to be the party of God. That's just so absurd. It's so absurd. I mean, God is a universal concept. Uh, you can't claim that. You can't claim that. And hell, half the damn people in the country don't even believe in it. So it's just, it's just it's pure madness. But, you know, again, it's all about power. It's all about control. It's all about, are these folks concerned about these babies getting killed? Yeah, as long as it ain't their babies. Are these folks concerned about the image we have for the rest of the world, they don't really give a shit, excuse my French, about what the rest of the world thinks because they think the world revolves around them. Hmm. The Caucasian European who's dying and who demographically is going to be in the minority in this country in a few years, it's going to be real different. And they know this, Trump knows this. So they're doing everything they can. They're packing the Supreme Court with folks who will uphold the uh, NRA and its ability to operate. And this is essentially a Nazi type organization led by some shady characters who are stealing money like mad. But they contribute heavily to the Republican, the Republican Party, as well as some Democrats. Guns were never going away in America, ever, ever. That won't happen. Since the assault rifle ban in 1994, we had. 40 million weapons, now they have over 200 million. Now we have 400 million guns in this country, which is about 70 million more guns than we have people. So as Ra said, the guns are never going anywhere. Never, ever, ever. They just need to be regulated. We need to have some sensible laws. We need to have some sensible penalties about people using guns to commit crimes and put these people away. Uh, one of the one of the, you're talking about justice, one of the things that, that, that kind of stands out in my mind is the handling of, I don't know if you guys remember when Anwar Sadat, the uh, president of Egypt was assassinated and it was done by a, a cabal of 52 military officers. Well, they arrested all of them within 48 hours. They put them in a public cage at the end of the town and in 30 days, the morning of the 30th day, they called all of the surviving, all of the officers' relatives to come and get their remains. They executed them that morning, uh, summarily executed them, and uh, boom, shakalaka. That can never happen in America. That kind of justice, I don't advocate that. But that's sending a message. That's why that doesn't happen in other countries like it happens in this country. You know, we have to pay a price for freedom in America. And the price for freedom is that we have to put up with maniacs and idiots. Not only our own citizens to see, and not only the people who are just Americans or just here, but our leaders are insane. Mm. If, if, if Donald Trump is not the classic picture of insanity and narcissism, I, I don't know what is. Mm. I, I just, I don't know what is. If, if, and, and other than just the, the world's ultimate kind man who he gets religious people essentially put him in the White House, so-called Christians put him in the White House and they know that he's not a Christian. They know he doesn't give a crap about abortion. They know that he wouldn't have them set foot in Trump Tower or Mar-a-Lago, but they, they take the, the stance and that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So we will support this con man who's not about us. He's all about himself, but he happens to select the same Supreme Court justice that we would like. 
he happens to appoint the same idiots and sycophants into office that we would like. You know, not only did he put three people on the Supreme Court, he put hundreds of federal judges that have lifetime appointments like the Supreme Court cats do. That's tyranny right there. How do we have a, a, a third branch of government that's not beholden to the people? You ever heard of a Supreme Court justice getting impeached? The madness that Clarence Thomas was going on in his household with his wife texting, you know, to overturn the government? Can you imagine if that would have been a Democratic administration that was going on with a Supreme Court justice? He'd have been gone. It's a double standard going on here. And it's and it's, it's really sad that, you know, a great country like this, and this is a great country, and has some great people in it. But the great people that we need to be leaders won't step forward because of all of the bullshit involved and the money and the control. The great people that we can get to get in there are just ineffective simply because the Congress. Wall Street prefers a Democratic president and Republican control of the House and Senate or vice versa. They prefer that. They're getting their money from both sides. Both sides are as guilty as the other. Well, why can't we get gun control passed? It's because of the filibuster. The filibuster means you gotta get 60 votes. So that means you gotta get 10 Republicans. Then it's not gonna happen. This is not gonna happen. Is the filibuster a good thing for America? Yeah, we think that it should be gone, but I don't I don't know. I you know I have mixed emotions about that because you know to get around the filibuster, as Mr. McConnell says, win the White House, win the Senate. That still doesn't work. Political gridlock is the name of the game. And it's all dictated by what? Green money, the dollar. With Wall Street wants separate people to run the country and separate people to legislate to keep the balance, to keep the money flowing. It's all about the dollar. The deaths of little black and brown kids, the deaths of those black elderly people in Buffalo, the deaths of the Asians, the death of the doctor. That just, that means nothing to them in the big picture because the big picture is all about money. Yes, sir. Um, Brother Machinda, you wanted to interject something right quick so we can get to the video? Uh, well, no, yeah, I'm just listening, but I wanted to, on that gun violence, I, I can't, I was trying to think of the psychology, it was a brother, I don't know, it was back in the probably like late 80s, early 90s, it was an LA Times article. Uh, this brother was, you know, had studied gun violence, the relationship. Uh, between, you know, guns and death. And anyway, the conclusion was what, what sticks out in my mind this years ago, but he was saying that basically, um, you know, as, as it relates to gun ownership, you know, I mean, you know, I own one, you know, but somebody gave me it. I didn't buy it, you know, I'm not justifying anything, but, you know, I never, you know, I grew up in, you know, in the CPT, you know, I never owned a gun, you know. I walked the streets. I've been in the streets. I might have thought I wanted one or needed one sometime, but survived, you know, coming up. But the point is, you know, it, I, again, I, it, I I wasn't knocking guns at the time, like, oh, you shouldn't have a gun. But anyway, uh, this study that this site black this brother that uh, the psychologist put out was that, um, and I wish I could think of his name because I'm sure the article is still out there somewhere. But he did a study. He said, you will die, you will die by your own gun before you have to use it on somebody, you know, just on the average, you know, what does that mean statistically, you know, they, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong, you know, I don't know, you know, the world is pretty wild uh, up until this point with all that's going on, what's been said on this podcast, and like, we know that it, they just stepped it up, you know, they just stepped, they just stepped crazy up, you know, to another level. So, you know, I don't, I don't know um, what, what the statistics are or the ratios are at this time based on his research, you know, 
doing the same, um, you know, uh, sampling or polling or statistical analysis um, that he used that would probably bring it up to date. But anyway, he was just making that point, you know, but there's a, um, again, all I'm saying is, is there's a concerted effort. There's a natural desire on their behalf to, you know, because this, you know, I mean, all the history I know about, you know, Caucasians, you know, and, and, and you know, it's like it's always been a divide and conquer type of uh, movement going on, you know, and the, it's and and, and super, superiority and, and supremacy and and things like that. So they're just they're they're trying to guard it with their dear life. And I just you know, again, I'm I'm sure I'm being redundant, but uh, but I just wanted to speak on that article. I'm gonna try to think of that guy's name one day or dig a little, dig a little deep and uh, pull it back out one day. All right, thank you. All right, let's go to this video. This is, uh, what's the lady's name, Brother Roberts? A Michigan lawmaker, Michigan State Senator oh. Mallory McMorrow. Okay, let's, it's four minutes long, so let's check it out. Thank you, Mr. President. I didn't expect to wake up yesterday to the news that the senator from the 22nd district had overnight accused me by name of grooming and sexualizing children in an email fundraising for herself. So I sat on it for a while wondering why me? And then I realized because I am the biggest threat to your hollow, hateful scheme. Because you can't claim that you are targeting marginalized kids in the name of, quote, parental rights if another parent is standing up to say no. So then what? Then you dehumanize and marginalize me. You say that I'm one of them. You say she's a groomer, she supports pedophilia, she wants children to believe that they were responsible for slavery and to feel bad about themselves because they're white. Well, here's a little bit of background about who I really am. Growing up, my family was very active in our church. I sang in the choir. My mom taught CCD. One day, our priest called a meeting with my mom and told her that she was not living up to the church's expectations and that she was disappointing. My mom asked why. Among other reasons, she was told it was because she was divorced and because the priest didn't see her at mass every Sunday. So where was my mom on Sundays? She was at the soup kitchen with me. My mom taught me at a very young age that Christianity and faith was about being part of a community, about recognizing our privilege and blessings and doing what we can to be of service to others, especially people who are marginalized, targeted, and who had less often unfairly. I learned that service was far more important than performative nonsense like being seen in the same pew every Sunday or writing Christian in your Twitter bio and using that as a shield to target and marginalize already marginalized people. I also stand on the shoulders of people like Father Ted Hesburgh, the longtime president of the University of Notre Dame, who was active in the civil rights movement, who recognized his power and privilege as a white man, a faith leader, and the head of an influential and well-respected institution and who saw black people in this country being targeted and discriminated against and beaten and reached out to lock arms with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. when he was alive, when it was unpopular and risky and marching alongside them to say, we've got you, to offer protection and service and allyship to try to right the wrongs and fix injustice in the world. So who am I? I am a straight, white, Christian, married, suburban mom who knows that the very notion that learning about slavery or redlining or systemic racism somehow means that children are being taught to feel bad or hate themselves because they are white is absolute nonsense. No child alive today is responsible for slavery. No one in this room is responsible for slavery. But each and every single one of us bears responsibility for writing the next chapter of history. Each and every single one of us decides what happens next and how we respond to history and the world around us. We are not responsible for the past. We also cannot change the past. We can't pretend that it didn't happen or deny people their very right to exist. I am a straight, white, Christian, married, suburban mom. I want my daughter to know that she is loved, supported, and seen for whoever she becomes. I want her to be curious, empathetic, and kind. People who are different 
are not the reason that our roads are in bad shape after decades of disinvestment or the, that health care costs are too high or that teachers are leaving the profession. I want every child in this state to feel seen, heard, and supported, not marginalized and targeted because they are not straight, white, and Christian. We cannot let hateful people tell you otherwise to scapegoat and deflect from the fact that they are not doing anything to fix the real issues that impact people's lives. And I know that hate will only win if people like me stand by and let it happen. So I want to be very clear right now. Call me whatever you want. I hope you brought in a few dollars. I hope it made you sleep good last night. I know who I am. I know what faith and service means and what it calls for in this moment. We will not let hate win. So powerful. Yeah, it, it, so powerful. it, it, it was uh, heartfelt. <laughs> oh, let me, one second. So yeah, I I thought it was good. Now I I, um, I subscribe to a lot about what Neely Fuller says. He said if if you're able to be a white supremacist and you can tell one color from the other, you're probably a suspect. I suspect that you are. And he also said that they will play both sides of the fence. Some of them. So with that being said, you know, maybe what she said was sincere and maybe not, but I thought it was good. That's my take on it. I thought it was real good. And, and that's, that's what Brother Machinda talked about next level. That would be next level when it comes to, you know, not looking at things in a racial manner versus a human manner. So, okay. So let's, uh, brother Ronnie, what you what you wanted? Why why did you want to present that this evening? Well, one of the things that made James Baldwin accepted somewhat among white society, and he was appeared on, on Jack Parr on all those late night shows. He was a constant guest. Was that he was not a racist? He was mentored by a, a white lady when he was five or six years old, who was sort of a nurse, nanny, teacher for him. So he really, he was exposed to white folks early on in life in, in, in an unnegative fashion, as I was. I was raised in Oklahoma City in the, in the 50s and early 60s, went to totally segregated schools, but had very limited contact with white people. But the white people that I did have contact with were genuinely really nice people. They, my, my parents, my grandparents worked for them, essentially, and my mom ended up working for them, and I also did. And they were just, we knew we were different, but they didn't, they treated us fine. Um, the Black Panther movement was pretty much funded by Hollywood Jews. The NAACP was funded by Jews in this country. Uh, Jews of being oppressed as, as we are in many, many instances, but they, they it's, it's more of a, a race than a religion or vice versa, but they're white people, absolutely. You, you know, wouldn't know you, half of them, you wouldn't even know they were Jewish unless they were to, to reveal it to you. So, you know, there have been a, a lot of good, good folks on, on both sides of the fence just like there are a lot of bad folks on both sides of the fence. You know, you bring up the name Clarence Thomas to me, I want to vomit just thinking about him. Herschel Walker, who I used to admire as a football player, running as a senator in Georgia, and can't spell cat if you spot him in the C and the A. Uh, it's <laughs> those coon preachers that were hovering over Trump's desk and, and clamoring for his reelection. So. You know, it's, it's not all a black and white thing. It's just a power thing. Again, it's a money thing. You know, they'll embrace those of us who are willing to come over and do their bidding. Uh, one of our 
James Baldwin's uh, famous statements was that uh, pretty, he said one of, one of the things he says, uh, <laughs> anyone who has ever struggled with poverty knows how extremely expensive it is to be poor. But another thing he said was, um, it becomes clearer for some that the more closely one resembles the invader or the oppressor, the more comfortable one's life may become. So, so many of us have, a clue, have achieved middle-class to upper middle-class status in our lives through education, jobs, opportunities, businesses, whatever. And, and we just can't be comfortable. We can't be comfortable at all. I want to close my part of the presentation with, with two more statements by James Baldwin. To be African-American is to be African without any memory and American without any privilege. Let that sink in. To be African-American is to be African without any memory and American without any privilege. And my last statement, which <laughs> It kind of sums me up and, and you guys as well. To be a Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be in a rage almost all the time. I gotta repeat that. To be a Negro in this, in this country and to be conscious, or relatively so, is to be in a rage almost all of the time. That's a powerful statement. It's a lot of angry folks in this world. And it's not just us, it's black men. It's a lot of white folks are angry about what's going on in this country too. And we got to hope and believe that it, it's going to change for the better. It's not going to be our generation that does it, but it's our generation, Ra and Rigo and Mascani and Mashima that are pushing the needle further and further into the eye. And our young folks, our grandkids, and maybe even our great grandkids will take up the mantle and make us a better world. Peace out. Appreciate that. Professor Ra, your response? You gotta uh, take I'm it off mute. I'm not sure how to help you with that. I appreciate what you said, if I understand correctly. And I first want to thank Brother Ronnie for his presentation. It was excellent. He always uh, make thought-provoking presentations and encouragement. I look at things uh, uh, somewhat in, in the same light, but with a different twist to a certain degree. When Malcolm said, I'm not a Democrat, I'm not a Republican, I'm not even an American, and I got sense enough to know it. Mm. I, I appreciate that. Uh, and, and, and I sort of address myself to that. Dr. Karinga always say, you're American by habit and you are African by choice. You have to choose to be black and conscious. To be, as uh, Brother Robert said, be a Negro in America and be in constant rage. Well, righteous anger and rational rage and rational uh, uh, understanding of why you have the rage you have. See, it's one thing for a minority of whites to stand up knowing that the majority is gonna rule. They can always be nice and kind and be for you. They can go to bed with you, they can nanny you, they can do that and do that, but they still benefit from white power, not white privilege. Because in order to have privilege, somebody had to give it to you. And black people didn't give them privilege to enslave us. It was white people with the power to do that. It's a long protracted struggle. As Baba Keeley always says, as long as we're fighting, we win. As long as we're fighting, we're free. To be conscious, and to live our life in a way in which we provide service, love, but our oppressor can never be our teacher. Let me say that again. Your oppressor can never be a teacher. Just like the fox can't teach the chicken. 
You understand? White folks, you know, I mean, I can learn from any white person, but they can't be my teacher. You know, teachers want to care about you. As Haki said, when you send your kids to school, send them to people that love them. Not to people, teachers that say you ain't going to be nothing. You can't be nothing and don't know how to teach. So it's a long, protracted struggle. I, I, I get up every day. It's a good day to struggle. It's a beautiful day to be black. Because I see the confidence and the achievement. While we're looking at death and maim and, and destruction, I think about the black people that are achieving in spite of the oppression. Not just in the athletics, entertainment, and in the, and in the integration, and the first Negro Secretary of State, and the first Negro Vice President, you know, the first Black this, and the first uh, I look at the thousands of kids that are graduated. I look at the Black people and the Black males that get married and raise their family. I look at the black women that make a way out of nowhere, even they, if they have a man or don't have a man, but they making sure that men that they raise be conscious of who they are and where they are. And, you know, it's a beautiful thing to see the beauty of black people in the, in the midst and the hills of North America. Of, 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 you know, to, to, to achieve the things that we achieve. I, I love the people that's fighting for reparations. I love the people that are fighting for better health care. I love the people that are fighting for justice and the deal with the industrial uh, uh, prison complex. I love the people that's dealing with black homelessness. I love the people that are revolutionizing the schools and finding new ways to reach out young people. So I don't get depressed. I can be uplifted. You know, and I, I, I always say this, as Amakal Cabral said, when he was in the bushes with some of his soldiers and they were surrounded and by the enemy. And he looked over to him, the guy next to him, and said, what are we gonna do, what are we gonna do? He said, we got them just where we want them. We in the belly of the beast. And we are the cancer that can transform this society into what it should be globally as an example of freedom, justice, and righteousness. Because that's our morality. We are the vanguard of morality and consciousness. We just want to live on the planet, take care of the planet. We don't just want to destroy it for greed or money, have a planet that we don't know will be here for our kids in 20 years. But we just want to live a productive life, a free life from oppression, and from greed and envy, regardless of what your spirituality is, go ahead. Even if you're atheist, agnostic, fine. There's enough space on this planet for people, as long as they live a righteous and good life for everybody. So again, Brother Ronnie, thank you, Asante Sana. And as we say in Kawita, the grains of sand on the ocean floor are numerous, but not as numerous as the many thanks that we give to you for your presentation. Asante, Sana. Excellent, excellent, Professor Ra. Uh, Brother Mashenda. Yes, thank you guys tonight. Thank you, Brother Robert. Thank you, Brother, appreciate it. Right. All right, uh, excellent, Ronnie. I mean, the information was superb and it's something we needed to hear and hopefully people can get something out of this and start doing some things 
better in their life. So I appreciate each and every one of you guys, Brother Machinda, Professor Rod, and Brother Roberts. Excellent job. So uh, next week, Professor Rod, we got anybody coming Monday? I'll call you in the morning. Okay. I'm trying to get, uh, I'm trying to get this brother named I Ayatollah. Uh, he's a, uh, well, he just, <laughs> He's just a unique individual that's been in the struggle for years. I told he's, trying Lamar. To get, he's trying to get the street, uh, Compton, the name of the street after Obama. And then uh, there's an, also a movement by his brother that's trying to get part of Crenshaw named after Malcolm X. So we'll be, we'll be one of them. Uh, so that's how the told him, Marv? Yeah, Marvin. Okay. Yeah, I just I, I saw him at at the uh, the what do you call it the funeral, Janazas. Janazas. Yeah. yeah, I saw him, and I got his number, so we could both work on that, Professor Rock. All right. So next next Wednesday, we got our brother Pruitt coming back from the African American Reparation Sovereignty, the AARF, and he's going to be talking about reparations and the program he he's a part of. So excellent this evening, everybody. Conscious Corner, and each one teach one. All right. Peace. <laughs> that was good, good.